Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's NCAS seminar. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jenna. I'm an AMS pharmacist and I work here at NCAS and with the RMH guidance group. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, so today we have three great speakers lined up um, who are all leading researchers in their field. We have Dr. Sajal Sahar, Dr. Leanne Teo, and Dr. Ruby Bison. And today we'll be going through a few AMS initiatives in primary care and the community. And having spent most of my time working on um, AMS in hospitals, I'm very keen to hear an update um, in this space. Um, so we should have some time for some questions after to each of the speakers. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A um, or if you want, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you as well. Um, so we might get started with our first speaker, which will be um, Sajal. So Sajal is a by training an academic pharmacist and a health service researcher in primary care. Um, he was an NCAS PhD fellow and completed his PhD in antimicrobial stewardship from Monash University. Um, Dr. Sahar has been working as a research fellow at the Centre for Innovation in Infectious Diseases and Immunology, Immunology Research at Deakin University since 2022. And prior to this, he worked as a pharmacist mentor to support establishing AMS in Timor-Leste. As an early career researcher, he has been successful in producing 45 peer review publications, securing a few research grants and multiple awards, including the 2022 Victorian Premier Award finalist for health and medical research. Um, and today he'll be speaking on point of care testing for antimicrobial stewardship in community pharmacy. So I'll hand over to you, Sajal. Thanks, Jenna. Um, I'll be sure. Yeah, can I see the screen? Yep, that looks great. Yep. Uh, thanks, Jenna, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be part of this NGAS seminar today. So, um, so I'll be talking about um, the scope of utilizing point of care testing in community pharmacy to improve antibiotic stewardship. Um, so now the diagnostic uncertainty still is an issue um, to optimize antibiotic use in primary care. For instance, only um, in sore throat cases, like 20% cases are actually caused by group A streptococcus, but up to 70% of these cases receive antibiotics. Um, for pneumonia and bronchitis cases are similar. There are a lot of uh, misuse of antibiotics, probably uh, because of some diagnostic uncertainty. So the question, the logical question is, can point of care testing actually address those issues in uh, particular in primary care through community pharmacy? And just a little bit of intro, the point of care testing is um, a kind of test that uses the quick diagnostic test during patient consultation. And the prompt result is can be used for clinical management, patient referral, trials, and treatment decisions. And the most popular point of care testing that has been used in different countries in different settings are CRP and the rapid antigen detection testing and the, the recent development of the nucleic acid-based gas granulitis testing. And it is to be um, rem reminded that the poor result and not a standalone make a, a rigid decision, but it has to be um, um, interpreted with the patient history, risk profile, and acute clinical situations. And from antibiotic history perspective, how that test gonna help? It determine the severity of infection, and some tests can confirm the bacterial infection, and it guide the antibiotic prescription that way and ruling out some serious bacterial infection. And it particularly helps identify patients who might be benefited from antibiotic treatment. So there are 
is a cochrane review that estimated about 24% reductions of antibiotic prescription um, through a point of gas therapy testing, particularly in general practice settings. And it might be up to 60% reductions when it is aligned, along, uh, pronged with um, the patient communication strategies. And there's a few evidence um, growing um, in the area of cost effectiveness of those testing. Uh, and similarly, the group A step based um, testing in French art is the one of the meta analyses um, showed that it is reliable uh, for accurate diagnosis and the management of sore throat in primary care. And there is a, a study in Australia um, in a remote um, settings that shows that this uh, test is um, seems to be practical and feasible in remote settings. But it's still there are um, many, many unknowns and the question remains. Um, but um, the, the likely benefit of those testing is uh, the diagnostic certainty that it increased the confidence of prescribing or not prescribing or delayed prescribing of antibiotics. And the results has ability to change uh, patient perceptions from demanding antibiotics. And, um, and more importantly, it helps um, efficient patient referral between GPs and pharmacists and it has potential to enhance the collaboration uh, between these two professionals. And it might uh, open the scope of collaborative prescribing as well, and collectively it might um, have impact of reducing unnecessary use of antibiotics. Um, though there are many, many questions that is still unknown. So we don't know what type of pop testing um, services are available in community farms around the world, and is POC testing feasible to implement in community pharmacy? And what the clinical effectiveness of those testing? Is it cost effective? And what are the implementation challenges and opportunities, uh, particularly in community pharmacy settings? To answer these questions, I actually um, designed a scoping review um, to see what um, the evidence exists globally. Um, so we got 20 studies around the world up to database um, screening, and I see the characteristics of the studies. We got 19 studies, those are just the feasibility trials, and we got only one RCD, and uh, the studies um, conducted mostly in uh, developed countries, and there are only two studies in low and income country. And out of this, um, the testing, point of care testing, so we got 15 studies actually um, tested um, feasibility uh, for rapid antigen detection testing for pharyngitis, and the five studies um, were on the point of the CRP testing. And you see the diversity of these studies. Most of these studies like in the UK, USA, uh, Canada, Australia, and a few studies um, from low income country like Syria and Nigeria. And um, so let's see the results of those studies. Um, so particularly um, this, this was a retrospective service evaluation study in Canada. So they recruited 204 pharmacies in British Columbia, Alberta and Nova Scotia. And um, they were um, recruited like 7,050 patients were tested um, for pharyngitis and uh, with an average of 27 years old um, and the children included in those studies. Um, and 25% of those patients actually tested uh, positive for gas infections. And antibiotic therapy was initiated within the same day in about 69% of positive cases. And this study actually highlighted the public readiness to access point of care testing service in community pharmacy and ability of pharmacies to expedite management of uh, gastroenteritis cases. And they conducted the patient survey as well. Um, um, so the study showed that the patients were really satisfied with the service, um, around 80% patient, and, and, um, and over 80% patients actually likely to have this service again 
Um, so some kind of um, a good positive uh, experience from the patient perspective. Now comes to an UK study. Um, this study and was an NSS funded um, short throat testing service in community pharmacy. Um, they introduced in 2018 and lasted up to 2020. And up to this time, uh, 11,000 pharmacy consultation actually um, go through for testing and RDGT was uh, tested around 9,000 patients. And to, so, so that's about like 28.9% um, test were positive. Um, and 21% service users were supplied with antibiotics. Um, so then, then the pharmacist really managed 91% of consultation in pharmacy and 99.3% uh, patient were actually referred to GP. So the study concluded that the service could potentially reduce the workload of other health practitioners in primary care and emergency care. So that's quite astonishing. And the point of the CRP testing in uh, pharmacy, that was uh, a feasibility trial in um, South Australia. And the study um, conducted in five community pharmacy um, without having collaboration with GPs. And uh, they recruited 131 um, patient. And the 45% of those were unlikely to have bacterial infections. Um, and the CRP was less than five. And, and only 14.5% actually were indicative of having antibiotic prescriptions. And, and the 12, 11, around 11% 11 were immediately referred to GPs. And 65% um, of those patients actually recovered at day five. So from operational outcomes, this service has provided 21% of eligible RTI uh, presentations and that represented uptake around 28%. So collectively, um, um, so there are two different kind of uh, implementation models followed. Um, so those testing was implemented with collaboration with GPs and without collaboration with GPs. So the three feasibility trials um, actually um, conducted two in the UK and one in Australia. Uh, without having uh, collaboration with GPs, um, without having like collaborative practice agreement as part of this study. And in, in the 503 um, RTA patients were successfully tested by community pharmacy on an average of 168 patient per trial or 4.6 months. And 1.7% 1 um, um, who had CRP greater than 100 and are indicative of must having antibiotics. And 76% um, who re, um, the CRP was less than 20, that was indicative of no antibiotics for antibiotic treatment. And 21% actually were in the gray zone. Um, 20 to 100 were indicative of having either delayed prescription or no script, and it based on the comorbidities. And on an average, 12% required GP referral after CRP testing in pharmacy. So, this study actually concluded that pharmacists were able to manage about 87% of heart infections individually. On the other hand, if the study was implemented with a GP and pharmacy collaborative practice agreement, the two EPA studies implemented in that way where the pharmacies are linked with the GPs. And the Northern Ireland study implemented this pilot in 17 community pharmacy, which are linked to nine general practitioners. And very interesting that 60% of RTA patients who tested in pharmacy were actually referred by collaborative GPs. And the 12% of patients were referred onward to the GP after CRP testing in community pharmacy. So it shows that if there is a collaborative uh, practice agreement, it is possible to both do a referral of patient timely to get this service. And the reasons of referral as reported in the study were high risk patient or persistent symptoms or systematically very annual or potentially who are CRP in the gray zone or above. Um, 100. And the both study reported that this collaborative agreement could be an important factor to make this program feasible to implement. From patient experience overall, um, there are three studies uh, evaluated patient experiences. 
um, highlighting Australian studies, about 50% of patients actually change their perception regarding necessity of antibiotics to treat RTIs. 14% um, at the end intended to seek GP's prescriptions after treatment recommendations by pharmacists. And 100% patients are highly satisfied of the service. 93% are willing to utilize the service again. And over 90% hold the belief that this service may enhance collaboration between doctors and pharmacists in future. So overall effectiveness and feasibility of the gastroenteritis testing program. So we got nine feasibility trials and overall effect of the program out of 21,000 patients who tested in pharmacy, 22% on an average were gas positive and 18% actually received antibiotic treatment. So it shows that it has potential to reduce antibiotic use. And the conclusion of this feasibility study, it, it shows that it is feasible to routinely implement and demonstrated their capacity to provide prioritized care in pharmacy. And it is also feasible uh, to implement outside of normal pharmacy hours, um, where it increased the patient access to the service um, in out of hours. And there's interesting um, reporting of the whether the patient are willing to pay for this service. The Australian study, it shows like um, in, the, in the survey, the less than 50% of patient uh, participant are willing to pay for the clock testing service. And it's about five to $10 by 41%. And, and others, um, and, and for around 40%, um, 15 to $20, and around 17%, 25 to $50 for the, bearing the cost of the service. But who are against the service, they say the government should be at this cost, and the participant financial constraint was a barrier to pay. Uh, having said that, like in this scoping group, only two, three studies, um, three qualitative studies we found um, that were conducted after those feasibility trials. And the most common um, reported challenge is time constraint of pharmacists and the rostering of pharmacists, particularly it is difficult to uh, predict the volume of RTR presentations during the service. So it is hard to roster uh, pharmacists of uh, doing this test and the remuneration and difficulty of patient follow-up was a problem if the, the, the pharmacist need to follow up the patient at day five or day seven, it is hard to um, make that happen. Um, and and where the pharmacist and GP collaboration um, existed, so the time the interaction with GP was a bit of problems. And um, sharing the test result and patient conditions and, and also one of the study reported that unwillingness of GP's receptionist to allow pharmacists to speak to GP, which is um, interesting. So despite the challenges, the pharmacists actually believe that there was a public demand for testing and their credibility and access to the service can increase uptake by the consumers. So the learning point of those um, uh, reviews. Um, so the POC testing appears to be feasible and well accepted strategy to facilitate in pharmacy and the consumer confidence um, on the pharmacy's advice could potentially reduce unnecessary GP visit and antibiotic prescribing. And it is um, important to improve access of um, POC um, training to the pharmacy and GP pharmacy collaborative practice agreement to implement that the strategy is really important, but there's a number of um, 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 the randomized control trial and the economic studies are extremely limited um, uh, in in no matter which context is. Um, so that is a barrier to implication for the policy. And the future directions, so the clinical effectiveness, cost effectiveness, and implementation of service requires um, to be assessed in Australia for uh, informing any policy and the collaborative practice agreement capacity building training and the clinical guidelines are needed to establish to facilitate um, um, 
POC testing service in pharmacy to improve diagnostic AMS in future. Um, thanks everyone. I'm happy to receive any questions. Thanks, Ajal. That was really great. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, for you in the chat. So we've got one first from Murray. Um, do you know how much the POCT CRP test costs in Australia? Yeah. Um, so the pork testing, um, so the, the key is actually around $12 per test. Um, so that's, and but the pork testing machine itself is around $4,000. So, but the gas fund that is testing one was a bit expensive. So it cost around $30 per test. Um, that was provided by the Abbott Diagnostics in Australia. Cool. Um, thank you for that. I think we've got also another question from Joanne. I yep. think Court can unmute you. There we go. Oh, th thanks very much. Yeah, I've got a question. So in some sure. of the countries you took, about the guidelines are very different to Australia. In Australia, actually, not everybody with a Group A strep um, positive test or a high CRP actually has antibiotics indicated. So I guess, and the other thing is there's a lot of regulation around um, accreditation for use of point-of-care tests, which mean that they're not generally available in general practice. So my question is, by introducing point-of-care testing in a system that uh, a doesn't support it and uh, B can be associated potentially with increased cost and over medicalization of what is essentially often self-limiting conditions. Mm. Are we actually introducing more cost and harm um, by potentially introducing point of care tests? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joan. Every country and every context is different. We, we, so the study shows that it has the potential, but if we describe in Australian perspective, we don't know the evidence, how effective these, um, the program is and how cost effective it is. So we need to really understand um, the practicality of this um, in Australian context. So, it, so there is a whole lot of research is missing to comment on that. So we don't know how um, responsive um, um, the community pharmacy and um, to this uh, testing. Um, so in terms of guidelines, how should we develop this guideline without having the contextual research? So there are only limited studies in Australia. We don't know. Yeah. Sorry, um, Sajal, just, just to clarify, if the guidelines say um, people with sore throat um, and strep infection, as long as they're not um, at risk of rheumatic um, disease don't need antibiotics, then why are we doing the test in the first place for the general population? So my question is, should your context be limited to people in areas with high levels of complications, for example, rather than the general Australian population? Because otherwise we're testing for things that shouldn't change management. Yeah, now do you want to agree? I mean, Absolutely, I potentially agree. So there are so many different settings, like rural settings, remote settings, and we don't know what settings and what implementation model um, 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 the res like respond um, in, in the, the way we want. We need the validation of those model in different settings as well. So without um, doing those trials is really hard to answer your questions in this um, context, I would say. Thanks, Sajal. Sorry, we might need to move on just in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Leanne. She is a senior lecturer of dental therapeutics at the Uni of Melbourne and a practicing dentist and registered pharmacist. And her research focus is on various aspects of medicine uh, use in dentistry and dental prescribing practices. So I'll hand over to Leanne now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jenna. I'll just share my screen now. Um, yeah, just one moment. Sorry, yep, here we go. That's it. Run. That's okay for you. That that screen's been shared appropriately. That's all good. Jenna, is that all right? 
Excellent. Thank you so much. So thanks so much, um, everyone, for being here, of course, and for NCAS for inviting me to speak. And I'll be continuing on with the theme about antimicrobial stewardship in primary care and, of course, talking about dentistry. And in my presentation today, I'll be uh, presenting a collaboration between three different universities where we effectively mapped out at a very high level um, an action plan for antimicrobial stewardship program for dentistry in Canada. So these are just my disclosures. I just wanted to highlight that this current research was funded by this particular grant, Manchester, Melbourne, Toronto Collaborative Grant. And so just provide a little bit of background because I'm talking about um, dentistry here in the context of appropriate prescribing in dental practice. The, um, I guess the main take home message when it comes to managing dental infections is that dental, dentistry is all about dental treatment and not drugs. And dental infections most commonly occur from holes in teeth. And that first picture with the, with the tooth, with the big sort of area of round mush in it, that's what we see as a dentist. We see that sort of um, presentation every day. Drilling and filling is our bread and butter. And when that cavity gets bigger and bigger, that cavity is full of bacteria. Um, it gets into the nerve. The bacteria and the nerve battle it out. And the nerve never wins. The nerve always dies. And an infection can form on the tooth, or it does form on the tooth. And to address this infection, we need to either do, we need to do dental treatment. We need to either remove the tooth, um, so remove the source of infection, or we do a root canal treatment where we open up the top of the tooth and expose all those anaerobes in that cavity to some oxygen. And either of those ways address the source of infection and dentistry is all about dental treatment. We don't need to prescribe antibiotics for localized infections, they're not required. And luckily that's the majority of infections that we do see in dentistry. Of course, when an infection has spread and there's a facial swelling or it's starting to spread to other parts of the body, antibiotics are definitely needed in addition with dental treatment to address the cause. But luckily, that's, that's not common. And so it's then surprising that dental antibiotic prescribing accounts for about 10% of all antibiotics worldwide, which is very high. It's high as hospital prescribing in some countries. Um, but up to 80% of those antibiotics are inappropriate depending on where you are in the world. And that's for both therapeutic as well as prophylactic reasons. The choices of antibiotics also differ between locations as well. So there's, there's the rate. And a few years ago, myself and some other researchers uh, got together and produced this paper looking at uh, different uh, antibiotics prescribed between different locations, between Australia, England, United States, and British Columbia in Canada, as you can see from the title of the paper. And when we look at this first graph, in the black, that's amoxicillin. And that's clearly the most commonly prescribed antibiotic in all those four locations. When it comes to second most commonly prescribed antibiotic, that's where things differ a bit. And as you can see in the um, graph for uh, United States and British Columbia, they prescribe a lot more clindamycin than the green compared to um, a couple of the Australia and, and England, which we do worry about, of course, of clindamycin and its association with C. difficile infections. The rates of prescribing differ as well, with dentists in the United States and British Columbia prescribing approximately twice that in comparison to dentists in Australia. And that's considered to be significant because the oral health of the population in each of those locations is actually considered to be relatively similar when looking at well-established epidemiological measures of oral health, such as um, caries experience or tooth decay experience, um, edentulousness, which is people with no teeth, and even access to oral health services, even though I'm, I know that the rates, sorry, the provision and access to dentistry in each of these locations um, is very different. And so given the high rates of inappropriate dental antibiotic prescribing, there have been some initiatives in some countries, particularly um, or the UK and in Australia, in order to address this issue in dentistry. So in the UK, they have the UK government antimicrobial stewardship toolkit that includes dentistry. There are some self auditing tools for dentists, and there's also some patient facing information, patient leaflets customized for dentistry about the appropriate management of toothaches and, and uh, urgent dental conditions. In Australia, we, the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, have included dentistry as part of their antimicrobial stewardship guidance. And the Australian Dental Association has also signed a pledge with the FDI World Dental Federation to commit to antimicrobial stewardship. And we piloted the digital tool to try and improve um, prescribing uh, as part of my PhD. And so given these initiatives in um, these other countries, 
when we uh, were looking at Canada, medicine and pharmacy have certainly uh, come a long way in Canada in terms of such approaches, but dentistry does lag behind in Canada. And so given these initiatives in these other countries, in England and in, and in Australia, we managed to obtain a grant called the Manchester, Melbourne, Toronto Collaborative Grant, where a group of uh, yeah, researchers from uh, Melbourne and Manchester worked together with a group of researchers from the University of Toronto with the aim to develop a sustainable AMS strategy for dentistry in Canada. And so our project that we call Taking a Bite out of Dental Antibiotic Prescribing, we divided it into three distinct but overlapping steps. So the first one was a dental antimicrobial uh, stewardship systematic review in order to try and understand what strategies have worked in the past and um, what, what, what has been done in the past in this area of dental AMS. So the second part were focus groups primarily conducted by the team in uh, with Toronto to understand the perceptions and the views, the opinions of the key leaders and stakeholders in Canada in terms of implementation of dental antimicrobial stewardship interventions and any barriers to this as well. And then using the results from both these two uh, projects, then fed into the development of a workshop that we held in Toronto uh, late last year. So I'd like to talk now, talk you through each of these three steps, uh, what we did briefly, starting off with the systematic review. So the aim of the systematic review was to evaluate the effects of antibiotic stewardship interventions to optimize antibiotic prescribing in dental settings. So we searched through seven databases and, and um, remove duplicates and so on. And we had three uh, studies that met our inclusion criteria. I should uh, mention that our conclusion criteria was fairly strict. And so we wanted to have only studies that had comparators, which is why we only had three randomized controlled trials that were identified. But I also wanted to highlight that, that there were also 18 pre-post studies as well that came out in that a part of that screening process. There has been a, certainly a lots of other work done in this area but just not that met our, didn't meet our inclusion criteria. So I should also mention that this um, article is still under review as well. So not published yet. So in terms of the three randomized controlled trials, um, uh, these are obviously in different locations, England, Scotland, and Beirut and Lebanon. And they had a couple of things in common. The first thing was that uh, bundles of interventions that were customized seemed to be um, seem to be effective. And these interventions generally comprised of education in person or face-to-face, -face, um, guidelines, ordinary feedback with personalized feedback. Um, and it tended to be, and there was one with behavior change messaging um, as well, but it generally tended to be bundles of interventions that seemed to be effective, that were customized to the uh, particular context. The other thing that was, um, that they had in common as well, that all three trials produced a reduction in the quantity of antibiotics prescribed, which we almost expect because we've got such high rates of inappropriate prescribing to begin with, we expect that an intervention will produce a reduction in the quantity of prescribing. But what's almost more important is that two of the studies also measured quality of prescribing or um, guideline compliance. And so two of them also showed that there was a, an improvement in the guideline compliance or quality of prescribing which is, as I said, almost more important, I think, because just as we don't want people with localised infections walking out uh, with antibiotics, we also don't want people with swellings walking out without antibiotics. We want an appropriate reduction in antibiotics. So that was the systematic review. And the second part were the uh, focus groups, which were primarily conducted by the team in, in Toronto. And this is also under review at the moment. So again, not published as well. So this was an exploratory qualitative study um, involving 22 stakeholders uh, in Canada. They underwent four one-hour focus group discussions with a semi-structured interview guide with the aim to understand the drivers of inappropriate prescribing and potential strategies as well. So they had a, a range of stakeholders in that um, in the mix and they identified uh, three main themes. So class, they ended up grouping them into three main themes in terms of inappropriate drivers of prescribing. So what they classified as old patterns uh, temporary solutions and then be in risk aversion. And in terms of potential strategies, they identified that behavior change is uh, and is really needed when it comes to improving, improving prescribing because 
we know that prescribing decisions, certainly in dentistry, are really complex. There's so many factors that go into that, into prescribing. It's not just about following guidelines. Um, many other, there's many other factors. There's patient pressure, patient expectations as well, um, system factors like how much time you've got to complete your appointment and so on. The second potential strategy was what they called no need to reinvent the wheel, as in learning from other previously trialed strategies. So exploring that a little bit further, in terms of the inappropriate uh, drivers of prescribing, so old patterns were knowledge gaps, discrepancies between uh, theory and clinical practice, and also lack of clear guidance. In Canada, they've got uh, guidelines for each province, but they don't have uniform guidance for the whole country. So identified that that was uh, an issue as well. Temporary solutions, this is mostly came down to behaviour, um, prescribing decisions, clinical time pressure is a, is a very well-known factor in dentistry that, that um, influences, um, influences prescribing. And other factors like medical legal concerns, um, patient expectations and wanting to keep patients happy and, and so on. Fear version were dentists who were reported concerns about if their infection would worsen and their patients were unable to find appropriate care in sufficient time. So those were the type of, uh, um, type of um, results that came out from the focus groups. And so using the results from the antimicrobial stewardship systematic review, so bundles of interventions, audit and feedback, guidelines, education, preferably in person, um, using, that, using that information, plus the information from the focus groups right, in terms of the barriers and enablers and the concerns they had about anyway, antibiotics prescribing in Canada fed into the development of the workshop. And so last October, the team from University of Manchester and University of Melbourne uh, met up with the team from University of Toronto to hold a, a workshop. And at our workshop, we had um, representatives or from all these organisations or, or key leaders and opinion leaders attend our workshop. We had a really diverse range of attendees, um, representatives from public health, Chief Dental Officer of Canada, uh, representatives from um, industry, from uh, clinicians and academics from dentistry, medicine, pharmacy, and oral surgery as well attend. And we divided the workshop up into three sections. So the, the first part were presentations from uh, representatives from uh, organizations within Canada, from British Columbia Centre of Disease Control, Public Health Ontario, and Choosing Wisely Canada. And they presented various uh, initiatives and community campaigns that have already occurred uh, in Canada, uh, learning from other previously trialed strategies and seeing what's already been done in other parts, so in like in medicine and in pharmacy. The second part were the international um, or presentations from, um, from other er areas of the world. So um, we had a information pre presented from England in terms of their dental antimicrobial stewardship toolkit. I mentioned that it contains patient facing information as well as sort self audit tools for dentists and also a presentation about behavior change and those uh, techniques that are um, elements that are needed in order to try and uh, change prescribing um, habits. The work from the FDI World Dental Federation was also presented, and the FDI have done a lot of work in this space when it comes to dental and antimicrobial stewardship. And one such intervention was that in 2021, they managed to get uh, 59 dental associations from around the world to commit to antimicrobial stewardship. And whether it's, I always say, whether it's quitting smoking or commitment to antimicrobial stewardship, all change starts with a decision. The countries in blue, the ones that have signed up. And that was in 2021. And so this year, um, actually end of last year, they then asked the countries who, dense, who signed the pledge, now that you've signed the pledge, you've had a couple of years, what have you done about it? So we're analysing the data from that information at the moment. Uh, we had a presentation uh, talking about guideline development, dental guideline development with the American Dental Association, and also about the antimicrobial stewardship uh, dental practice chapter book uh, from the Australian Commission as well. And the third part of the workshop was that we put people to work and they all had to come up with uh, an action plan effectively for dentistry in Canada. And we had three key findings from the workshop. The first one was data collection. And all the um, data analysts here will all know that having robust data, especially baseline data on prescribing trends allows us to understand uh, prescribing choices, prescribing trends, any 
inappropriate prescribing allows us to target particular areas as well. So identify that that's needed and also needed to be able to measure any interventions from and see the effect of any interventions as well when it comes to um, changes in prescribing. So identify that data collection is needed. The second key finding was about education. So implementation of education about AMS within the dental school curricula, streamlining it, and also um, mandating it for dentists as part of their continuing education, potentially making this free as well in order to improve access. They also identified that guideline development was needed in this area as well to try and get uniform guidelines for the whole of Canada and also behaviour change, as I mentioned before, identifying and targeting factors that influence inappropriate prescribing um, as well. The last key finding was accountability. And some participants suggested that antibiotics should be tracked and monitored a little bit like other controlled substances such as narcotics in order for dentists and dental practitioners to ensure accountability uh, for their prescribing decisions. But it was really the first two key findings from the workshop that um, influence, has influenced the, the next steps for an action plan for Canadian dentistry. And so that was our project to um, create a, a sustainable antimicrobial stewardship strategy for dentistry in Canada. And the workshop really marked the initial engagement of a very diverse group of participants committed to a unified action plan for dentistry in Canada. And we hope that this plan will be adaptable to other countries who are looking to develop such interventions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Leanne. Um, sounds like you're doing some really great work um, in AMS space in dentistry. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat and just in the interest of time, we might need to move on to Ruby. Um, and then, yeah, we'll see if we have any time at the end if anyone's got a burning question for Leanne. Um, so Ruby is a senior research fellow. She has over 15 years of general practice and primary care research experience. Uh, she does have a medical microbiology background in hospital and community, and she's a mixed method and implement Implementation researcher with a passion for infectious diseases and AMS and hand hygiene. So I'll hand over to Ruby. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Um, am I showing the right screen? So it's a presentation? Yes, you are. Perfect. Okay, excellent. So I just want to say um, thank you for the invitation and for something pretty much completely different to the other two speakers. I want to actually go through a little bit about what we've done um, in terms of promoting hand hygiene in young children through educational gaming. So um, before I start, I also want to thank um, my wonderful students. So we had four faculty science students who actually developed the board game, had a Master of Public Health student that did the first phase of the project. And then last year, I was lucky enough to have an honor student that actually did the second phase of the project as well. So um, why hand hygiene? Hand hygiene plays an important role in health and effective hand hygiene leads to reduction of infectious diseases and we all know such as respiratory tract infection and diarrhea in childcare settings um, as well as school and in the home. So it doesn't actually just affect the children's health but also absenteeism in school and productivity for parents being away from work. So the theory is if we teach young children early in life and help them understand why hand hygiene is important, we hope that we can sustain their hand hygiene practice. So towards the end of 2020, um, if you can remember, that was the year of the pandemic, um, I set for science communication students a task to develop a game or concept of a game that will promote hand hygiene in young children. So they developed this game called Happy Little Hands. So the aim of that um, of the project was initially to pilot this educational hand hygiene board game, Happy Little Hands. So the board game targets children um, between five to seven years in the age group and consists of playing cards. So as you can see here with day-to-day -day activities that involve hand hygiene to increase children's awareness of the importance of hand hygiene. So it also consists of a list of these day-to-day -day activities and, and soap-shaped bottles. So the game's, the game's really simple. So to start off with, each child takes a list. So on the left-hand side, which consists of these different day-to-day -day activities. So you place all the activity um, cards face down on the flat surface and each 
um, child tax turn, turning it over. So if the activity card matches the one on the list, you can see here, um, the player puts a card on the sub bottle here. But if they pick up a card that's not on their list, then the card is turned face down, put back into the file and onto the flex service and it's now it's the next child's turn. So the first player who collects all the cards on the list wins. So as you can see, the card not only increases the young children's knowledge around day-to-day -day activities where home hygiene should be practiced, it's also a little bit of a memory game for this age group as well. So in terms of the methodology, we initially um, organised the project to be conducted in the prep class in a local primary school because that's what we're targeting the five to seven year old. But however, due to the COVID lockdown um, in Melbourne, that was in 2021, we have to transfer the delivery of the research project into a virtual in environment. So in order to do that, we had to organise a time suitable for all facilitators um, and family over a Zoom conference session. But I'll go through the methodology and details in the next two slides. So we provided each family with a game pack consisting of the board game, um, printed questionnaire and children's play maps. So we started the, patient, um, the session asking the children, um, why do you think, um, well, do you think hand hygiene is important or hand washing hand is important? Do you like washing hands? Can you show us how to wash your hands? Then we asked them to complete a simple questionnaire, as example here, with day-to-day -day activities that they thought they should wash their hands before or after each of these activities. Then we then demonstrated um, the correct hand washing technique um, from the CDC, which includes singing happy birthday twice. So after that, we asked them to play the board game with their parents or with their sibling. Finally, we asked them questions around whether they liked the game, what did they like about it, and what did they like about the game. And the session was recorded by Zoom. So five families with six children participate in the study aged between five to eight years. So here's a snapshot of my master's student here on the left corner um, facilitating the session. And there's me, I'm hoping I don't look too bored. And here's the other facilitator as well. And these are the kids. Um, so you can see that um, the children were participating in the session wearing their play mask. So here's another screenshot where the children were copying Jill's hand washing motion and singing happy birthday. Finally, this screenshot of the children playing the board game itself with the family. A few of them were particularly shy initially um, because they don't know um, the other kids, but became more engaging as the session progressed. So when we asked them the question, why do you think hand hygiene is important? One child actually said, because you don't get any germs on your hands and you can usually do it when you go out. And also if you touch something, it might give you a virus and you need to wash your hands with soap. I thought that was quite cute. All children thought the game was fun. So when we discussed with them after playing the game, aside from the initial shyness, children were mostly engaged in enthusiastic. They all took turns answering questions and modeling hand hygiene motion during the demonstration. And it was also really good to see at the end of the session, they were still smiling. So then we did conduct the parent interviews with some of, with all of these parents. We asked them whether they thought the children enjoyed the game. And while they did during the session, most said that they didn't play it again afterwards. Parents with older children thought the games was a little bit simple for them. However, the children all liked the colourful pictures on the playing cards. All the parents commented that the face mask was the hit and they kept playing with it even after um, the session. However, there was no noticeable difference in hand hygiene practice that the parents have actually said. However, they did say that the kids were more aware of when they should wash their hands. All parents did agree that during the COVID can, pandemic, this actually made their children more aware of hand washing. However, they all thought that more work needs to be done to sustain their behaviour. 
So what are some of the lessons learned from this study? The game is acceptable and fun for young children. However, it was a bit simple for the seven to eight year old, um, and it should be aimed more towards a four to six year old age range. Children are more likely to be engaged with their peers. So the Zoom environment with unfamiliar faces make the session a little bit awkward for some of these kids. They were definitely challenged to online research. So children were shy and didn't interact initially with children knowing the other children. This could have been different in a classroom environment where the kids will actually know each other. So COVID changed the children's attitude towards hand hygiene. So while they're still more while they're actually more aware of hand washing than pre-pandemic, we do need to continue to help them understand the importance of hand hygiene to sustain their behaviour. Zoom environment is acceptable to conduct research, but we found that it was a little bit more difficult to young children for young children. So with the feedback from the parents, um, we know that our cohort needs to our game needs to be suited to more of the four to six years of age. And then this needs to accommodate with the pictures. So the young cohort, because some of these young cohort may not be able to read at this stage. So we had a go again. So what we did was we changed the list. So this is what the original list looks like. We have the list of activities. However, besides this one, somehow got in there, everything else was just random pictures. So what we then did was we put in the exact playing cards that suits the, um, the activities on the list here. And then we thought, hey, we don't have to target a younger cohort. So what we did was we moved into a face-to-face -face environment rather than Zoom and we hit the four-year-old kindergarten. So the aim of the second part of this was actually to pilot the educational hand hygiene board game in a four-year-old kindergarten. So the methodology is um, the same, except that it's we have a pre and a post intervention. So we targeted a four-year-old kindergarten. We gave them some knowledge questions. We asked them to do the um, questionnaire again. We did the hand washing game and we played and we got them to play the game. We leave the game at the center for three weeks and then we come back. We actually assess their knowledge again and then we ask them to show us how to um, wash their hands and then we conducted parent interviews after that. So once again, we started a session saying, you know, why do you think washing hands is important? Do you like washing your hands? Show us how you wash your hands. We did the simple questionnaire again, and then we demonstrated the um, technique, and then we played a game, and then three weeks later, we came back for a visit, and we conducted parent interviews, parental interviews, and this time we were actually successful. So this is a leafy, um, very busy, um, Actually, it's a childcare centre with three-year-old and four-year-old classes in the middle of Eltham. So if you can see the picture on the left side, this is my wonderful honour student. Um, she was leading the um, project and all the kids sitting on the play mat with their play masks on and having listened intently and answering her questions. So here, this is where they were then split into groups and then they were given the um, activities and asked them, you know, should they be washing their hands before or after these different activities. Then the honor student demonstrate how to wash their hands, um, the proper CDC technique and did it um, singing happy birthday twice. And then we actually asked the um, kids to sing happy birthday with her while she's washing her hands. Then we asked the kids to come in three, four at a time um, to actually wash their hands and, and able to um, sing happy birthday at the same time as washing their hands. Then we played a game. So we split them into groups of two because we have two sets of games. As she can see, there are some kids that are very intense of trying to um, place the um, cards with the list, even though they, some of them don't know how to read at this stage. Afterwards, they all came back to the mat 
And that's when um, the on student asked them questions like, did you enjoy the game? What do you think about the game? And so forth. So we've repeated this procedure three weeks. We left the game with them, repeated the procedure in three weeks and asked them the same question. So let's look at quickly look at some of the results. So um, we had 22 students that, oh, students, children that were between the age of four to five participated in the um, pre-intervention. Um, when we came back three weeks later, it was actually during school holidays. So we actually missed three um, kids, which actually is not that bad um, during the school holidays. Handwashing demonstration was around 40 seconds, which is the CDC guidelines where you do it, you know, um, happy birthday twice. However, both pre and post intervention with children's hand washing remain only around 15 seconds long. In fact, they were very enthusiastic singing happy birthday. However, um, some was already drying their hands, singing, um, and they haven't even started the second um, happy birthday song. Um, in terms of the knowledge question there that we gave them, you know, when should you wash your hands before or after? We looked at it and 66.25% was, um, you know, correct in the um, initial part and then 72.5% after. I don't think there's any um, significant difference that we can draw on that and I'll talk about why. So in terms of interviewing with the parents, we interviewed four mums and they were aged between 26 to 40, 45 years of age. These are the four main themes that we followed. Um, we asked them what the children thought about the game, the hand washing, um, the knowledge, and whether most importantly sustained the um, hand hygiene practice. So the mums, in terms of the game, um, the parents said, oh, they didn't really mention anything about the board game. They just walked around and singing happy birthday. So we know that happy birthday was a hit. About hand washing, they did actually learn something because one of the um, kids came home and showed them how to wash their hands and that um, they were checking the hand washing and making sure that um, they were actually still singing. Around hand hygiene knowledge, they did actually um, talk about having a new towel and that they need to change the towels into new towels and the clean towels. However, um, sustainability, it's still a bit of a problem. Um, they did it initially, but it was short lived, this one of the mums said, and there really wasn't a lot of sustainability. So we know that kids are excited about washing their hands because they sing happy birthday. Um, knowledge question was a bit of a problem in that setting because while we put them into groups, we explained to them, tick the box before, if you think you should wash your hands before or do you think, you know, or you can tick both boxes. They were looking at each other's um, answers, trying to see what, you know, Joe next to them were actually putting in. And then they kept asking a question, which box was the before? Or oh, which box was the after? So they didn't really understand. So maybe because the kids were actually too young to understand that, they were still very excited about um, the animal play mask and that they were really happy that um, they could take them home afterwards. They did enjoy the game um, because it was similar to the shopping cart game. However, it's a bit that we don't know if they played straight afterwards, even though um, one of the kindred um, assistant I talked to after said that, yes, they did pull it out and play. However, sustainability of hand hygiene remains a problem. So what's the next step? Or is there a next step? I would like to think that um, there is next step. And I would actually want to um, say that, is it going to be an online system or is it going to have an award system that, you know, you can, if you do the correct hand hygiene, you're going to be, you know, awarded some way within the game. So this is my very poor um, graphic designing to think that we can actually put the game into like a PlayStation, well, um, dreams and hopes um, into future. But we think that we do want to um, use gaming to be able to um, help um, kids understand and sustain that habit. So thank you.
That was great. Thank you, Ruby. I think that's definitely the cutest uh, AMS infection prevention initiative I've ever seen. Um, we're just a bit over time now, um, so we might have to leave it there. Just one quick question. Is the game available to buy? Um, no. <laughs> Not yet. But Not I'm sure I yet. can um, make you a copy if that's what you want. So um, contact me and I might be able to make you a copy Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone um, for joining today and thank you to our amazing speakers. I will just quickly hand over to Court who will give us a quick update on the next NCAS seminar. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Jenna. Um, yeah, thanks everyone that stuck it out uh, to right to the end. So yeah, just a reminder that next month's another broad topic about the microbiome. So should appeal to the masses, whether you're in uh, community care, dentistry, um, primary care, in the hospital, aged care, everyone. So looking forward to see you all then. Um, and the recording will be made available on the NCAS website for this presentation at the end of the week. So thank you all and see you next time. Bye, everyone.